In this first video, we're going to take a look at creating our project, working with basic materials, and creating masks. Let's get started by creating our Substance Painter project. So I'll start by going to File and choosing New. Now in the New Project window, I want to make sure that the template is set to PBR Metallic Roughness. I can choose it here from the drop-down. For the file, I need to hit the Select button, and I'm going to choose the 3D model that I want to build my Substance Painter project from. So I'll click Select. So here I'm in SpiderBot Geometry, and I'm going to choose the SpiderBot.FBX. So I'll click Open. And so now we've loaded in the geometry file. Now next, we're going to set the document resolution. Now I'm going to start this off with a value of 2048. Substance Painter is non-destructive, so we can actually change this later. But for now, let's just go with 2048. I will leave everything else at the default and then click OK. Substance Painter is now loading the scene, and here we go. We have our project. Now would be a great time to go ahead and save the project. So I'll go to File, Save As, and here we can save the project. You can see that the save type is a .spp for Substance Painter Project, and we will click Save. All right, so here we have Substance Painter, and we have our project, and we're ready to go. You can see here that the prominent view is the 3D view, and we need to learn how to navigate this to start. So if you hold down the Alt key and use your left mouse button, you can orbit the 3D view. In order to pan the 3D view, hold down the Alt key and use your middle mouse button. Now I can pan the view. To zoom in and out, I want to hold down the Alt key, my right mouse button, move up and down to zoom in and out. And that's how we can navigate our 3D view. Now you'll also notice here that the 3D view is lit. So it is actually lit by what we refer to as an environment map. So let's come over here to the far right side on the UI and you'll see there's a button and it's called Display Settings. I'm going to click this button and you can see that this panel appears. Now the first tab is the Environment Settings tab. And if we look, you can see here that we do have a map and a button. So if we take a look at this opacity slider, I'm going to set this all the way to 100. And then I'm going to take this blur and set this all the way to zero. Here you can see that environment map that I was talking about. This is a high dynamic range image that Substance Painter uses to light the 3D view. And if we want to change the lighting direction, we simply need to just change the environment rotation. And I can do that by adjusting the slider. You can see here that as I adjust or rotate the environment, the lighting changes. We can more clearly visualize this by enabling our shadows and then rotating our environment. Now, a better way to work with this environment rotation is to use a keyboard shortcut. So if I hold down the Shift key, use my right mouse button, left to right, you can see that I can rotate the environment. Now, like I said, if we want to change the lighting, we could simply click this button here and then choose a different HDR map. So for example, if I choose something like this Cave Entry Forest, we get a completely different lighting setup here. All right, so what I'm going to do for this course I'm going to switch this back to the default panorama, and I'm going to set the opacity setting all the way to zero, and for now I'm going to disable the shadows. All right, so that's how we can navigate our 3D scene as well as rotate our environment lighting. We'll use this environment rotation keyboard shortcut quite a lot as we work through our project. So let's just continue taking a tour around the Substance Painter UI. So here at the top right, you'll notice that we have our texture set list. In Substance Painter, a texture set represents the materials you assign to the mesh in your 3D application. Each individual material becomes a texture set with its own dedicated layer stack and channels. When you export, each texture set results in a set of bitmap files with a file for every channel of the set. I can enable and disable texture sets by just clicking the eye icon. Now, right below the texture set, we have our layer stack. This is where we're going to do all of the work as we build up our textures and materials. Each texture set has its own layer stack, and it also has its own set of well settings. Under the texture set settings is where we can do things like access the resolution for the set. So like I said, Painter's non-destructive. We can actually move up and down this resolution stack. Here we can also set a different shader instance. Or if I scroll down, we can add additional channels here to work with the shader. Materials can be broken down into individual channels. Each channel represents a material property like color, metallic, or roughness. 
Fill layers can act as a material in the layer stack as they can fill one or more channels with a texture or a uniform value. Now, since we're already in the texture set settings, I'll continue to scroll down and you'll notice that we have this section called mesh maps. This is where I can bake a set of maps. Baking is a step where you save or bake geometry information from your mesh into texture maps. Baking is not a requirement, but it can speed up your texturing process a lot. The information stored inside your bake maps is used to create procedural effects like wear or dirt, and it can even help with your material placement. So now that we understand that baking maps can help aid us in the texturing process, let's go ahead and do that here for this particular project. So I'm going to click the Bake Mesh Maps button. A dialog here appears. Now for the output size, I'm going to go ahead and set this to 2048. Now on the left side is where I can enable and disable bakers. Now in this project, I do not need the thickness baker and I do not need the normal baker. So we're just going to use this set of bakers. And I'm actually going to leave everything at the default state to keep things simple. However, I do need to make a change to my ID baker. So I click the baker. You can see here that it navigates here to the settings for the ID baker and the color source is set to material color by default. For this project, I created vertex colors in my 3D application by adding a color value to the vertices that make up a 3D mesh. I did this so that I can place materials on the model by simply choosing a color value. So in order to accomplish this, I need to set the color source here to vertex color. The ID baker, when set to vertex color, will render the vertex color data from the mesh into a 2D image. Now, I want to stress that working with vertex colors is not a requirement. I'm just showcasing a common workflow in Substance Painter, which allows me to place materials quickly. I can manually place materials on the mesh if I do not want to use an ID map. I can set the color source for any texture set here in the bake options. Here we have the body set and we also have access to the legs. So instead of having to go and choose the legs and setting additional settings, I'm just going to hit apply to all. This means that the color source of vertex color is applied both to the body and the legs texture sets that you see here. So now all this is set up, all I need to do is now come over and hit bake selected textures. This is going to bake all of the textures for both the body and the legs texture sets. And you can see it actually is a pretty quick process here in Substance Painter, we're already completed. So here I'll click OK, and if we look at the body, now underneath our mesh maps you can see that these mesh maps have been added to the appropriate input slots. Also if I select the legs texture set, you can see that the bake maps that are associated with the legs texture set have already been set here as well. All right, so let's jump back here to the body and that takes care of the texture set settings and the baking process. Now, as we start to work, you'll notice that we have this properties panel. This is a context sensitive property that's going to update depending if I'm working with a brush or if I'm working with a fill layer as we'll discuss a little later on. So directly below our 3D view, we can see our shelf. So the shelf is just a library of content that we ship with Substance Painter. It gives you things like grunge maps, alpha stamps, as well as various types of brushes that you can use in your projects. We're going to grab and use content from the shelf as we build up our materials and textures. However, one thing I like to do is I like to undock the shelf. So all of the panels that we've been discussing here can actually be undocked and they can be repositioned to build up your own version of the UI. So here in my case, what I like to do here at the shelf tab, I'm just going to left click and drag to tear this off. And I'm going to park it over here on the left side of the UI. You can see that it opens up as I move my mouse over. I'll let go of my mouse. And now the shelf just snaps and is applied to the left side of the view. I feel like this is a lot better because now you can see that I have a, a more maximized or complete 3D view. It's not being split in half. And it just makes things a little bit easier to work with. And like I said, now here we have our shelf. If we go over to say something like our materials, we have a set of material presets and we'll start to use those here in just a bit. And speaking of these material presets, let's go ahead and start building our first material. This is the body texture set. This is where we're going to start. And I'm going to come over here to the layers tab and I'm going to start to build some layers. Now, by default, you'll see that we have this layer one. It's already created for you every time you create a new project. And this is a paintable layer. There are two types of layers in Substance Painter, a paintable layer and a fill layer. We'll get to both as we progress through the course. But this paintable layer, you can see, I can just actually paint directly here on the 3D mesh. 
Okay, so let me undo that. And we're not actually going to start here with this paintable layer. So I can just delete it. I don't need it. And we're going to start with a fill layer. A fill layer can represent a material, which allows me to fill channels with values to produce a material. So let's start here by just using this button to add a group. This is just a layer group. And I'm going to double click and I'm going to name this color 01 because we're going to have this kind of two tone color material. And now I can start to add or build content within this layer group. So I add the layer group just for organizational purposes. Also, it's pretty handy when we get into masking. As you'll see, we're able to use a layer group to mask a whole set of layers. All right, so let's jump back over here to our shelf. We were talking about material presets and we have our materials category here. And what I'm going to do is here in the search field, I'm going to do a search for plastic. And you can see that, you know, it starts to filter the content. And here is a material preset that I want to work with called Plastic Glossy Pure. I'm going to left click and drag and drop this material into the layer group. And you can see that a fill layer is created as indicated by the paint bucket icon on the layer. And so now if we take a look here at my properties panel, the properties panel is context sensitive. So it's going to update with properties based on what you have selected. In my case, it's a fill layer. So I have the options here to set things like my projection and scale of the layer, as well as set the material properties, which is what I want to do first. And you can see here that I have some core channels enabled by default, color, rough, and metal. And this is going to be perfectly what I need. So for the base color, I can come in and click this button. This gives me a color picker, and then I can just choose some color values. So say I want to do something like this. There we go. I've changed the color. Now, Right below it is the roughness channel. So what we get by default is this slider, this uniform slider. And a black value is going to equal like highly reflective, like a mirror. And as we start to move this slider towards white, you can see that we start to diffuse the reflection. So here we have this uniform slider for basically controlling how reflective the surface is going to be. And then right below that, we have our metallic slider. So if we have this set at a value of black, black meaning no metal. And if we set this here to a value of white, we get what looks like a metal value. So in this case, with the combination of this particular color and metal, this looks like I have some type of brass material. Okay, so for here, we're going to set this all the way back to zero, and I'm going to open up the color picker once more. Here on the right, I have an image that contains a set of color swatches. I can click the eyedropper on the color picker to sample color values. Using left click and drag, I can sample any values underneath the eyedropper. Here, I'm going to sample a swatch from my texture. You can find this image in the SpiderBot Textures folder, swatches.png. And so I'm going to choose this value. And that is how I'm going to set my color value. So previously, we were talking about this roughness slider and how it's just this uniform slider. But that's, uh, that's pretty boring. So what I'd like to do is basically augment or change this value uh, or drive it based on a grunge or a roughness map. So what I can do, I'm going to jump over here to my shelf. Let me hit this X button to close out my search. And if we look at grunges, you can see that we have all these grunge materials that we ship with Substance Painter. So I can grab one of these grunge maps. I can left click and just drag and drop and place it right here on the button. And that will apply this grunge map. So you can see that we're already starting to break up that highlight based on this procedural material. Another way that you can work with this, let me just hit this X button here to get rid of that is I can click the button itself, and this opens up what we refer to as the mini shelf. It's just a miniaturized version of our shelf. And I can come over here to the resources tab, and I can start to do a search. So I'm going to search for grunge, rough. You can see it filters through the list. And I'm going to start here with this map. This is grunge, rough, dirty. This is actually a pretty good one that I use often. So now that I've filtered the result, I can just left click on it to apply it here. So what we've done is we've taken a procedural texture and we've applied it here to the roughness channel of our fill layer. So to get an idea of what this is doing under the hood, let's come up to our 3D view. I'll click this drop down and here I'm going to choose the roughness channel. So here you can see again what we've done. We've taken a grayscale texture and we've applied it to here to this roughness channel. And this is what it looks like. Now we have some controls here since this is a procedural texture, we can make some changes here to the balance and the contrast. And we'll do that in just a bit. But for right now, I want to come over here to the properties. I'm going to hit this button here, which allows me to take a look at the projection and scale settings. So at this point, we've taken a 2D procedural noise and we've applied it to a 3D mesh. If I come up here to the top of my UI, I'm going to switch this here to my 3D 2D split view. 
This allows me to see the UV layout here for my body texture set. And you can see here that we have all these UV shells and they're rotated in different ways. And when we apply a texture like this, you can see that, well, everything's moving in all these different directions based on the layout of the UVs, of course. The texture doesn't look like it's uniformly applied, and we're also definitely going to get some seams. So a good way to work around this is to come over here to our projection mode and change this from UV projection to this option called triplanar projection. So when I do that, it's going to take this texture and it's going to reproject it in 3D space. So that's why we have this 3D manipulator here in our 3D view. And you can see that already the texture looks like it's been mapped uniformly now because, again, it's being projected across the X, Y, and Z axes. Also, the main benefit of this is that we're not going to get any seams, so we don't have to worry about, you know, aligning our UV shells. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to jump back over here to just my 3D only view. And now I'm going to come over here to the scale. Because this is a procedural noise, it's completely seamless. So I can actually tile this across the surface by introducing a higher scale value. So in my case, I'm going to set this to a value of 2. And so now this seems to more appropriately match the scale of my UV layout. Now, again, I can scroll down and I can start to tweak some of these parameters. So for example, for this balance here, I want to set this to a value of 0.4. And here for the contrast, I want to set this to a value of 0.14. So I'll just type in 0.14, hit enter to lock that in. This grayscale grunge map simulates the microsurface imperfections of the material, like scratches and dents, which scatter light rays that hit the surface to produce variation and diffusion in the highlights. Okay, so let's look at the result of this grayscale procedural noise. We are looking at it in the roughness channel. Let's jump over here to our material channel. And now here you can see if I zoom in close, I'm going to hold down the shift key, right mouse button left to right to kind of move my lighting around. This is always really important when you start to work with your roughness. We want to see how that lighting is being broken up by that roughness information. So now you can see that we get this kind of subtle detail in the roughness and we get a more realistic result. The appearance of our roughness value is affected by our shader quality settings. I'm going to go to the shader settings and by default, the quality is set to low 16 samples per pixel. This low setting may not give you the precision needed to accurately match the roughness values computed in real-time 3D applications. By setting the quality to high 64 samples per pixel, you provide more samples for the shader to produce a higher fidelity result. The goal is to set a shader quality setting in Painter that matches as close as possible to the 3D program you are using. This way, you can correctly gauge roughness values in Painter and know they will react similar in other 3D applications. Now, I no longer need this 3D manipulator, it's kind of getting in the way. So at the top of the UI here, I can just come over to this far left button and click it here to disable or hide the manipulator. All right, so at this stage, we already have a pretty basic material. It's just using a single layer, which is a fill layer. We've set a color. We've set a procedural noise here for our grunge. However, I'd like to maybe add just a little bit more nuance here to this material. So this time, I'm going to add a filter to help me do that. So with the layer selected, here at the top of the layer stack, I can click this Add Effect button. So I'll click this button. In the drop down, we have this option here for filters. So I'm going to add a filter. You can see that it's added a filter to my fill layer. Now I just need to, well, choose a filter. So if I come over to the shelf and I click the filters, this is all the filters that we ship with Substance Painter. So I could find what I want, left click and drag it to the button. However, it's always best just to use the mini shelf. So we'll click the button. You can see that it's already context sensitive. It's filtering, well, for filters. And what I'm going to do here is just, uh, I'm going to do a search here for galvanized. I'll start to type that in. And we have a specific matte finish filter called galvanized. This is really good when you're working with kind of metal materials. So I'm going to left click to add this filter. And already you can start to see that, well, something's happening here in our 3D view. We're starting to uh, add some additional information. Now, this filter has added information to the normal channel. So if I click my drop down here and I choose normal, you can see that we have this normal data. The RGB components correspond to the X, Y, and Z coordinates, respectively, of the surface normal. It is used for faking the lighting of bumps and dents. So now I'm just going to drop back to the material mode by just pressing the M key on the keyboard. So now, just as with anything, we want to start to, you know, tweak some of these values. 
So here for the scale, I'm going to set this to a value of nine. And then for the flakes intensity, you know, we're going to use a pretty low value for this. So I'm going to type in um, 0 0.07 and then hit enter. And there we go. So we just want kind of a nice subtle effect. Again, we'll zoom in pretty close. Let's check our lighting. Shift, right mouse button, left to right. And you can see this filter adds another level of variation as it breaks up the lighting across the surface. So at this stage, we have our material and it's applied to the entire body of the robot. However, I would like to restrict this material to a specific area on the robot. And to do that, we are going to rely on a mask. A mask is a grayscale texture that is used to reveal or hide the contents of a layer. White in your mask means that the area will be visible. Black will be invisible. Masks are a key part of the workflow in Substance Painter. They can be painted manually or generated based on baked maps. With masking, you can work smart and efficient, creating even more complex materials. So now let's create a mask. I'm going to create a mask on the layer group so that all the layers contained within this group will be masked. I'm going to click the Add Mask button and choose to add a black mask. This creates a black mask which completely masks the entire material. So as you can see, we no longer see the material on the surface of our robot. Now I need to create the mask, and I can do that through various methods. First, let's take a look at painting a mask. So you'll notice here that the mask is selected as indicated by this light blue outline. This means that I can start to paint directly in this mask. However, that's not the best way to work. I would recommend coming over here to this add effect. So we'll click the button, and I'm gonna to choose to add a paint effect. Now, this gives me a layer within my mask. This is a much more flexible way to create a mask. So with the paint effect selected, I can now come over to my shelf and I'm gonna choose my brushes option. And you can see here that I'm gonna use this basic hard brush as a preset. So now if I come over to the 3D view, I can just start to paint. And here you can see that I'm painting with a white value and this reveals or unmasks the material. Now I know that I'm painting with a white value because if I take a look at the properties, here we have these tabs. The first tab here is giving me things like my brush settings. But if I take a look at this grayscale tab on the far right, this allows me to set the value that I'm going to be painting. In my case, like I said, white. Now if I set this value here to black, black giving me transparency, and I start to paint, I'm basically masking or hiding the material. Now we can toggle between these two views pretty quickly by just tapping the X key on the keyboard. So I'll tap X, I get the white value, I am revealing the material, I tap X again, I get the black value, and now I'm masking the material. So this is one way that we can create a mask. We can just simply paint it. So I'm gonna give you a second option for masking. Now we did create this paint layer and I mentioned that this is the best way to work. And the reason for that is with this paint, you can see that I can come in and I can actually name this. So I can call this painted mask. Now I have a name, I know what this is actually represents. I also have a set of blending modes. So as I create multiple paint layers within this mask, I can combine them using blending modes. I can also play around with the layer opacity here. So again, you just get more flexibility. Now in my case, I actually don't want to use this mask, so I'm just going to disable it by clicking the eye icon. So let's add another mask. So here you can see the process. I select the mask, it's outlined in blue. I go to add effect, and I'm gonna choose another paint. Now with this selected, instead of using my paintbrush, I'm gonna come over here to my toolbar, and I'm going to choose the polygon fill tool. So I select it. Here in the properties, I now have some options. The two options you'll work with is mesh fill and UV fill. So you can see here with object selected and with a value of white, I can click any area that represents a mesh part on the 3D model. So simple click and it completely fills that mesh part with the value that I have set. So again, white, I'm now revealing the material. I'll hit control Z to undo that. And now let's take a look here at my 3D, 2D split view. Now the other option that is useful is the UV fill. So I'll select the option. Again, I'm setting this as a white value and I can just fill based on one of these UV shells. So for example, if I click the body, we fill based on that UV shell. I can click here in the 2D view or the 3D view. 
So let me name this paint effect Polygon Fill. And I'm gonna take my view back to my 3D only view. And so now let's just look at a third option. So here I'm gonna come back to my effect once more, and this time I'm going to add a color selection. You can see the color selection is set to the ID mask that we baked at the very beginning of this video. This is also going to show the reason why we're using this ID mask. So now what I can do is simply come over here to pick color. The ID map is now shown in my 3D view, and I can simply come over here to the 3D view using the eyedropper and choose a color where I want to mask. So in my case here, I'm gonna choose this green for the body, and here we have our mask created for us by just simply clicking the color value. In some cases, when you're creating your own 3D models, it may be more easy for you to select polygons or vertices in the 3D application, assign a vertex color that you can bake to an ID map to make tricky selections a lot easier here in Substance Painter. But as you can see, we have the flexibility and we have these three options that I've showcased here that allow you to quickly create masks here in Substance Painter. In our case, we're going to use the color selection, so I'm just going to remove these other options that we demoed. I'm gonna come over and click the X button to just delete those. As a bonus, I wanted to also showcase the geometry mask, which was added in Substance Painter 2021.1. The geometry mask will allow me to mask based on mesh parts. So instead of creating a layer mask, I can enable the geometry mask by simply clicking this thumbnail. In the properties, I can see the mesh parts that make up this model. I can then disable or mask mesh parts by clicking on them in the 3D view. Now, when I click on the layer icon, you can see I have created a mask for my layer by disabling mesh parts. If your 3D mesh is divided into multiple parts, using the geometry mask provides a quick method for creating masks without having to bake IDs or hand paint. Which method you choose all comes down to your workflow and preference. The good news is, is that Substance Painter offers multiple methods for masking to suit your needs. This is going to conclude part one. We created our project, baked maps, created material, applied filters and grunge maps, and discussed masking. Take some time to practice what we've covered thus far, and when you're ready, join me in part two, where we will continue building materials.